Hebrews chapter 2, it says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you in, in love and humility and thankfulness with grateful hearts. Thank you for our assembly, God, which is so important, coming around your table, hearing the word of God proclaimed, fellowship and in prayer. Just be with us, God, as we take a few minutes to reflect on your words, the words of the apostles, and try to apply them to our hearts. Most importantly, God, help us not to neglect our salvation, which is so great in your eyes and should be great in ours as well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the writer calls it a great salvation. It was brought into the world through the announcement of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospels. It was confirmed through the sign wonder, the apostolic ministry of the apostles. And the apostles were special people. They were great men. And, and last week I talked about how you don't tamper with the apostles. You don't claim to be an apostle. You don't claim to have the power of an apostle. You don't claim to be a successor to the apostles. These, these ministries of the apostles that we read about in Acts were unique, one of a kind, non-repeatable, non-transmittable ministries. Even the angels want to look in. That's, salvation is so great. The Christian faith that was revealed, Peter said that even the angels desire to look into the things that we're talking about today. So you put Hebrews 2, 2 through 4, and you put that together with 1 Peter 1, 9 through 11. They're sister passages. And, and in both cases, the Hebrew writer and Peter wants us to remember our salvation, wants us to remember what we got into when we became Christians. Our salvation is so great. You know, I hope we don't neglect our salvation. I hope we don't take it for granted. I don't think that God could give us a greater gift, and the truth is we do neglect it. We do take it for granted. We don't pray like we should. We don't read our Bibles. We're not in the Word of God. We're not faithful to the assembly like we ought. And when we judge ourselves around the table, you know, are we in the right framework? Why is our salvation so great? There were seven reasons. Because God thought it. God prophesied it. It was in his mind before the foundation of the world. Jesus bought it. The word redeem means to purchase. He purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. The Holy Spirit brought it, the events of the, of the things of Pentecost. You didn't argue with people over the plan of salvation on the birthday of the church, beloved. <laughs> Not when Peter and the, and the 11 apostles have a fire on their head. There was no question as to who was giving the word of God and what that word of God was. Because the Holy Spirit brought it. The day of Pentecost was composed of supernatural events, supernatural processes. Just like the world was brought into existence through creation. I'm a creationist. I don't believe in evolution. I don't see evolution. And we have processes in science that are processes of conservation. But we know that Things are not being created nor destroyed today. You see, the, the first law says that there's conservation. Matter and energy are conserved. And it's the same way in the spiritual world. The church was created whole by God, just like the chicken came first, created adult, mature, but afterward the egg. So also the church was brought about by supernatural processes of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people on the very first day but ever, everybody that even on that day and ever after has to come to the Lord through the sowing of the seed, through the hearing of the word of God. The apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, but now 
we're born of the Spirit. We get the indwelling. And I want to put a plug in, by the way, for our Christian Kingdom College. We're going to be meeting at Festival Hall Tuesday night. We're not in the basement this year. We're going to be in the ballroom for our first, uh, first class Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And we're studying what the Bible says about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So I hope to see you there. And so while the Holy Spirit baptized the apostles, every one of these men ever after had to obey the word. They had Even the apostle Paul was sent to Damascus to inquire of the house of Ananias. He says he will preach you words whereby you may be saved. Nobody's going to be saved without the hearing of the gospel. And the apostles taught it. But today I just want to talk about a few men. A few men, a few wise men. What good would the plan of salvation be if, if men didn't receive it? Now the road is broad that leads to destruction, and many there are that go. And Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. But there are wise men, thank God, there are wise men who still seek the salvation of God. I just listed a few here. Wise men from the east came in Matthew's account. Luke's account does the manger scene. Matthew's account gives the wise men from the east, Matthew 2, 1 through 2. The centurion who approached Jesus, Matthew chapter 8. He was a foreigner. Let's look at the Ethiopian nobleman, Acts 8, 27. The centurion Cornelius, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. These were great men. Lydia, a great woman. The Philippian jailer, we don't have his name. It's just the keeper of the prison. But let's look at Acts chapter 8. I call him the Ethiopian nobleman. I don't know why. I don't know who ever started that thing about the eunuch. Why would we remember this great nobleman for the characteristic involved when men would serve at the court, especially to a queen? Her name, we call her Candace in English, Candace. But this man was a nobleman. <coughs> he had guard of the treasury. In Acts chapter 8, 27, we read about him. It says, So Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I? Unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. He was a nobleman. Sometimes today we preach the gospel and we're selective with our marketing. We preach the gospel to the poor. We help the needy, and we know that's all a part of the gospel. But I want you to know that the gospel was also for the rich. The gospel was also for the aristocrat. God, now Paul said, not many wise men, not so many noble are called. He said that in the first Corinthian letter, and it's true. Some people think they're too high and mighty for the things of God. And yet, God put it in the heart of this Ethiopian to love the things of the kingdom. And this Ethiopian nobleman is one of the first of the three people that I want to bring to you today who sought that great salvation. Now, the Ethiopian, he's a black man. Ethiopia, in the Bible, is called the land of Cush. And, you know, we celebrate black history. A lot of times today, there, people try to alienate the black man from the gospel. And certainly the Muslims are try to play that up. There's a, a guy, Louis Farrakhan, trying to stir up, and he doesn't want the, the black people to receive the things of, of the gospel. He doesn't want black people to be Christians. He wants them to follow Allah and follow Muhammad. 
And so sometimes the devil gets a wedge. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. And my first candidate today of, of a wise man who sought the gospel was this Ethiopian. But this Ethiopian had a few advantages. You know, when you try to call on people, you try to get a foothold, something that you can identify, that connection that you make. You know, it's not easy anymore. In the old days growing up, you used to go out calling and knocking on doors and showing film strips. We had film strips back in those days and a record player. And uh, when it would beep, you know, we would, uh, my job was to change the, the slide. And, and there were Bible illustrations on those slides and scripture verses. You know the Jewel Miller uh, film strips. And then they switched to video cassettes, and I suppose now they have them on the DVD. But you try to establish some connection. This Ethiopian had already had a foundation. And so we have to be able to perceive that today when people know uh, the Bible. It's nice when you're talking to somebody. They know who Abraham was or is. They knew Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They know about Moses. At least they know about the Ten Commandments. I told you the story I was riding down the road and witnessing to Brother Colton and we were right driving to Mount Crawford and I told him that uh, remember Moses when he came down off the mountain and he delivered the nine commandments and I just kept going and Colton looked at me with a wide eye and said well what happened to the tenth one <laughs> and I said praise God it's nice when the person you're witnessing to the person you're talking to has a little bit of knowledge about the Bible isn't it and so the Ethiopian nobleman, he had a foundation. He knew about Isaiah, but he still needed help. He still needed a guide. And Paul said uh, this foundation that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this foundation that's being laid is Christ. Now, they were fighting in, in the Corinthian church about what minister had preached to them the gospel. Some of them had Apollos preached to them. Some of them received the news of the gospel through Paul. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, Paul's kind of rebuking him. He says, you guys are carnal. You guys are trying to create a political organization here, like parties. One of you is of the party of Paul, another of Apollos. He says, you're carnal. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We don't know who the person was that shared with the Ethiopian his knowledge of the Old Testament. We don't know who delivered the scrolls or the Sunday school teacher that at one time had labored back in the classroom to teach the young person. And maybe that Ethiopian had gone up through Sunday school teaching wherever he was from, even though he didn't know about Christ, in the Judaism that he was taught. Nobody, no name is ever mentioned. But I'm so glad that Ethiopian knew about Judaism. I'm so glad that he knew about the, the monotheistic God named Yahweh of the Jews. I'm so glad that a foundation had been laid so that Philip could preach Jesus to this man. For no other foundation can be laid, 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so it's up to us to take heed how we build. The foundation's laid. Make sure you are good framers. Amen? The framers come in and build on the foundation, and we got to make sure we put up a frame that is square and plumb and true and build on that foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a whole sermon in this Acts 8 text. It said Philip opened his mouth. Philip opened his mouth. <laughs> yeah, well, what does that mean? You know, beloved, how many at times... God calls on us to open our mouths. What do we open our mouth over? Some people open their mouth about God when they hit their nail uh, with a hammer. And they open their mouth, and the name of God comes out. I was listening on the radio. The radio commentator a few weeks ago said that, that the golf course and the congregation have a lot in common. In a way, they're like churches. One is called out to entertainment on Sunday morning, the 18 holes. The other is the two or three people who are gathered in the name of Christ. Both of them invoke the name of the Lord. One invokes the name of the Lord when he slices the golf ball. 
The other invokes the name of the Lord in the consecrated invocation of his name. Do we open our mouths? When do we open our mouths? And for whom do we open our mouth? It says Philip opened his mouth. There's a time not to be silent. There's a time that God gives to every one of us the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. It says Philip opened his mouth. Now secondly, it says he began at this scripture. How many times have you heard people say that they want to do something for the Lord, but where do you begin? It's kind of like me trying to clean the house. You know, where do you begin? A lot of people want to do something, but they don't know where to begin. And to me, some of the most profound lessons that can be learned are these little statements that the Bible writer uses. Philip opens his mouth, and he begins at this scripture. The guy's holding the scroll of Isaiah, crying out loud, where are you going to begin? Start with that prophecy. Start with that scroll that he's holding in his hand. Whatever situation in life, whether at work, whether at home, whether in our family, worship God. You, you, you take and seize that opportunity, whatever opportunity you're in, whether you win a football game, whether you lose a football game, whether you're fired at work, whether you get a promotion at work, every one of those opportunities are opportunities to praise Jesus Christ. And it says he began at that scripture. In other words, God meets us where we're at, and he takes us where we're at. He, he leads us. And he presses on, and he brings us to where he wants us to be. But God takes us where we're at, at every stage in life. What did he preach? Verse 35. All it says is that he opened his mouth, he began at this scripture, and he preached Jesus. Now what is it to preach Jesus? That's all it says. He preached Jesus to him. I'll never forget going out with my dad when we were young. and My dad always had a little Bible study that he would use, and he'd use it over and over and over again. He, he would put out his fingers, and he, had, he said there are seven things about Christ, the seven phases, the seven aspects of Jesus' ministry. He was born of a virgin. He was unique. No one ever was born like Jesus was born. He was the God-man, born of a virgin. You know, Jesus asked the question when his mother and brothers came to visit him, and they said, your mother's here here's the Son of God, and they're telling him his mother's here. Do you get it? You know, Jesus claimed a heavenly descent, didn't he? He said, no man ascends. The Son of Man descends. Here Jesus came down from heaven, and they're saying, your mom's here. Well, they had said a lot worse about him. They had said a lot worse about his mother. Because if you're born of a virgin, you're going to be at a little bit of a disadvantage from a humanly perspective relating to people, okay? But if you're the God-man, what other way to prove your divinity? Are you with me? And they said, your mom's here. And he said, who is my mother? I love those questions. Who is my mother? God said to Cain, where is uh, uh, Abel, your brother? Where is Abel? He said to Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> those are profound questions. He preached Jesus, and they said, your mother's here. And Jesus said, who is my mother? Who are my brethren? Those who do the will of my Father who's in heaven. You see that spiritual answer? If you do the will of Jesus, you are his family. It's not talking about earthly relation. And so, seven phases. He's born of a virgin. He lived a sinless, perfect life. Nobody ever can measure up to Jesus by virtue of his virgin birth, by virtue of his sinless life. No one ever died like Jesus died. I told you, Jesus died not for what he did. Every criminal who's ever been prosecuted, who's ever been crucified, was crucified for what he did, crimes. You know what was written above Jesus' cross. No one has ever been crucified. No one has ever been condemned for who he was rather than for what he did. I'll tell you something else about the way Jesus died. He laid his life down. Every person who dies, you know, our lives can be taken, but no one can lay their life down. Who can really claim to lay their life down? He said, I lay my life down for my sheep. Nobody could take it. The Roman soldiers didn't take him. Pontius Pilate didn't take him. Even the Sanhedrin, the Jews, didn't take him. He laid his life down. His burial, 
Nobody was buried like him. Uh, even though he died the death of a, of, a, of a terrible criminal, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. In his disgrace, we see grace through the disgrace. Even the burial. Nobody ever resurrected from the dead of their own accord. He said, I have the power to lay my life down. I can take it back up. There were a few people resurrected, but nobody else has ever resurrected themselves. Amen? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is unique because of his ascension. He ascended up into heaven. And the angel came down and said, why are you gazing up into heaven, you man of Galilee? Get to work. Get to work. And then nobody's like Jesus because he's coming back. The parousia, the coming of Jesus. I looked that up. I, I was looking for second coming. You know, it not, doesn't ever really say second coming. Hebrews says he's coming back a second time. But it just called it the coming. The coming. You know, he came twice. The first time he came to deal with sin. The second time he's coming, he's coming for you and me. And maybe that's something like what the, Philipp, the Ethiopian preached. He preached unto him Jesus. Now, it doesn't say that he told him to be baptized, does it? But we know that preaching Jesus would have included the plan of salvation, amen? Because it says, he just preached to him Jesus in verse 35, but in verse 36, Philip didn't even have to say. The Ethiopian said, look, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so preaching Jesus would include the plan of salvation, and the plan of salvation would include baptism. And they went down into the water, and he baptized him. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered him, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Went down to the water, baptized him. Verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. You know, that's probably the one part of the plan of salvation we leave out. He went on his way rejoicing. You know, do we go on our way rejoicing? People say, well, I'm under the circumstances. I was reading some of the great quotes. Napoleon said, I make my circumstances. <coughs> Napoleon said, I don't, I'm not under circumstances. I create my own circumstances. Mickey Matthews said that you don't get lucky on a football field. You recruit your luck. We had a sign in the wrestling room over at JMU. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And I told the coach, really, that's not luck at all. He said, yeah. He said, it's a big joke. I don't believe in luck. I believe in working out in the weight room and all the practices. And Christ creates our opportunities. Christ makes our opportunities. There's no reason why any Christian should be under circumstances. And it says he went on his way rejoicing. How come we're not going on our way rejoicing? If we would just leave that baptistry and go on our way rejoicing, people would know that we have a secret to life. We have the purpose of living. Now there's some other men. Acts 13, verse 7. Time doesn't permit to explore all of the, the avenues, but here was a proconsul. Now I looked up proconsul. Pontius Pilate was not a proconsul. He was a procurator. So was Felix and Festus, and in, in, in later on, whom Paul preached, to whom Paul preached. The proconsul is the governor. You can call him a governor in English. He's the governor of an unsettled region. But the proconsul is more important because he's a, a governor of an established Roman territory. So the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, is even more important uh, position-wise than Pilate, than Felix, than Festus. It says he was an intelligent man. I would love to think that we're preaching to an intelligent people. Wouldn't you love to know that you're preaching to somebody that, you know, had a 4.0 and was smart? You know, you could really work with a guy like that, right? But I looked it up because I had this funny feeling that, I had this funny feeling that uh, the gospel is more than just meant to be preached to somebody who's smart. You see, beloved, every one of us is a son of Adam. Every one of us has been given gifts by God. Every one of us, by virtue of our creation, uh, has been created smart. I can show that in the Bible. Every one of us has gifts, has talents that God's given us. Even the world, God gives gifts, even though they don't use them for His purposes. 
I looked that word intelligent up. It, it doesn't mean smart. It means prudent. Here was a man who was prudent. Now, there's a difference between being smart and having knowledge and being wise. This guy applied the knowledge that he had. He was a man of position, but he was a truth seeker. That's why he was prudent. He had discretion. He was a man that could be entrusted with the responsibilities of government because he cared about truth. Jesus told Pilate, I am truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? This guy knew truth, and he was interested. Pilate was kind of noncommittal. He was apathetic to the truth, but not this proconsul, Sergius Paulus, who was the governor of the island of Cyprus, a very important island, the, the greatest island in the Mediterranean, the island of Cyprus, which the emperor wanted, but the Senate maintained control of. And he was prudent because he sought to hear the word of God. Verse 7. And that's what we're preaching on today. Men sought it. The Ethiopians sought it. Sergius Paulus sought it. You see, here's the plan of salvation. Number one, you need to seek to hear the word of God. Jesus said, you have an ear, why don't you use it? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. We, all of us have ears. We're all created with ears. The problem is we don't want to use them. We've got bad hearts. It says he sought to hear the word of God, verse 7. He believed and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. How come the word of God doesn't impress us anymore? A lot of people read the Bible, they hear the words of God, angels are curious, they're looking in with a microscope wanting to find out the things that we're wanting to know, the apostles, the Holy Spirit, and yet we're just oblivious to the things of God. We're just, we're neglecting our salvation. We're taking our salvation for granted. Not Sergius Paulus. He was amazed at the teaching of the Lord as given to him by the apostle Paul. He was a great man. Let me be negative. 1 Corinthians 2.14. We read that in Sunday school class today. Let's talk about the people who don't care about their salvation. <laughs> though they receive it or though they never got in on it. There's some people who don't care. It's the soulish man. Now, you know the soulish guy? The natural man? The worldly man? He's living by his soul. For instance, you know the rich man? He said, I will say to my soul, you know, thou hast laid up many great treasures. This I will do. I will tear down my barns. I will build bigger barns. Isn't that the story of our life? Trying to tear down our barns and build bigger barns? There's nothing wrong with owning a barn. You see, what he was doing with his barn was what was wrong. But that was the whole purpose of his existence. It was his soul. The soul was his heart, his emotions, his will, his interest. And his heart wasn't for the Lord. His interest was not toward the Lord. And he was a carnal man. He was caught up in the things of the world and his own soul power. And the word of the Lord came to him, Thou fool, this day your soul will be required. And so the worldly man, the soulish man, he doesn't care about salvation. Matthew 20, 15, we, we read this Wednesday night about the parable of the vineyard. You know, there were guys working all day in the, in the, in the heat of the day. You know, the heat of the day means when it's right overhead. You know, it gets hot around... 12 o'clock, doesn't it? 1 o'clock, the sun's right overhead. And then it goes down, and if you can just make it through the afternoon, you know, then it's not so hard. And here these guys were working all day in the Christian vineyard, but these guys got in at like 5 o'clock, the 11th hour, and they quit at 6 o'clock. They start at 6, they quit at 6. 6 in the morning, 6 in the evening. And some guys were given a job at 5 p.m. and they work one hour to 6 p.m. and when they went to pay him they paid everybody the same day's wage a denarius and these guys were mad and <laughs> the owner of the vineyard rebuked him and he said many things to them he said friend I did you no harm didn't you agree to work for such and such a wage is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things or is your eye evil because mine is good we call it the evil eye. We studied it. Other places, it says your eye is impure. Your eye is envious. Your eye is jealous. Don't underestimate the power of jealousy, the power of envy that can infect a Christian. The truth of the matter was the Jewish people had worked for 4,000 years of the Old Testament and the Gentiles didn't work at all. The Israelites had borne the brunt of the work of God since creation. 
and now you're going to let these Gentiles in at the last second, and they're going to heaven the same as us? I don't think so. You know, putting their foot down with God. And God said, go your way. You guys are envious because I'm good. I'm going to grant salvation on the Jew and the Gentile. And you should be rejoicing. You should be giving glory to God that salvation and the light is made to both the Jew and the Gentile. But they were jealous and envious, like Jonah the prophet. The people in Nineveh repented. God spared the city, and the prophet's mad because he wanted God to drop a bomb and rain down fire on him. He wanted the people to die. And that's a terrible condition to be in, to be a hard-hearted, holier-than-thou, pharisaical church member who wants to tell people, GD, you know, he preaches to him, you know, God's going to damn you, and he can't wait for it to happen, can he? And he said, you got an evil eye. You're unworthy of salvation. Matthew 22, just a chapter over here. It's the parable of the wedding. And here God sent these wedding invitations out. You know, a wedding invitation. You've got to buy the, the card, a beautiful card, and you put it in an envelope. And the craziest thing I ever heard, you stuff that envelope inside another envelope. Two envelopes. It's a special invitation. You're either coming to a graduation or coming to a wedding. I never heard about that for funerals, do they? They don't do that. I don't think they send out uh, invitations to funerals, do they? All right, Matthew 22, 8. It said that, that these guys made fun of this wedding invitation. And so they went out, they made fun of it, and uh, the people who were doing the inviting, they went out and did, uh, persecuted them and even killed them. And the king, when he heard it, was furious. He sent out his armies, destroyed those murders, burned up their city. So you better not... Reject the invitation of God to come to the wedding. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So that's the third category of people who are unworthy. The people who are not worthy are unworthy. Do you get it? I didn't call them unworthy. The Lord said they're not worthy. Think about it. That's a terrible thing. God predestined the plan. He didn't predestine the man. We have a choice. Isn't that a little hard to think that some people are not worthy? I have people say, John, you know, there must be something wrong with your personality. I don't know why. People, everybody in the church can't get along with you, you know. And, you know, you think, man, maybe I could have handled it differently. Maybe I could have said something differently. Maybe I could have approached the situation differently. You know, you, you go through that, right? People aren't happy in the congregation. Not our congregation. <laughs> but congregations uh, in time, in history. And you think, you know, what could we have done? Why is there dissension? Why is there somebody uh, upset? Why is there somebody with a countenance fallen? Why has somebody uh, got a bitter heart? We have to come to the cold, hard truth. We have to come to grips. We have to come to the reality that the, our Lord and Savior said there's going to be some people who just are not worthy. They're not worthy to be a disciple. And you know, the Lord will even make it hard for you. How about the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the law. I've kept the law. And the Lord said, maybe you have. But the Lord knew there was one thing holding that guy back. He was a wealthy man and he loved his riches. Nothing wrong with being wealthy. You can be a wealthy Christian. But you see, he loved his wealth more than he loved Jesus. And it was almost like Jesus was kind of putting it Something in his heart. See, you didn't pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. He knew what was in the heart of man. And that one thing that was the, the, the problem in his life, Jesus brought it up and put it right in his face. He said, sell all your possessions, give your money to the poor, and come follow me, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Think about it. Now, that's a wager, isn't it? That is a wager. Think about that for a minute. I'm sure that guy caught everything Jesus said. Go, sell all your possessions, give your money to the poor, come follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And he's thinking, you know, like Jeopardy. Da, 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 da. Or how about Price is Right? There's, you know, you get the first showcase, you can pass, you can take the second showcase. A new car. Two showcases, right? You can have treasure on earth, or you can have treasure in heaven. And he had to think about that. And he walked away sorrowfully. He walked away sorrowfully. 
because he loved his possessions. He loved his earthly treasure. Remember Esau? He sold his birthright for a pot of soup. What does it profit if a man gain the whole world and lose his soul? They de we deserve more than hellfire. A person like that, eternal hellfire isn't worthy enough to consume that man who trades his salvation for a pot of soup. He's unworthy. He's unworthy of the love of God. Yes, they rejected the wedding invitation, but the call still went out. Go out in the highways. Go out in the byways. You know, how many of us are kind of highway, byway people? We're not the governor of Virginia. We're not a nobleman. We're not the secretary of the treasury of the United States of America. But how many of us have, were in the highways and byways and a preacher came and preached to us the word of salvation? Go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. And it says that the wedding was furnished with guests. Yes, beloved, there are still people who sought it. God thought it, Jesus bought it, the Holy Spirit brought it, the apostles taught it, and men sought it. There were many people who responded to the gospel. You ask, well, my name's not written in the Bible. Yes, it is. In Mark 8, 8 34, Jesus said in the King James, I like Mark's account, you know, whoever wants to be my disciple, it said, whosoever will come. That's my invitation. Is there anybody here today that wants to fill their name in the blank? Whosoever will. You've heard the gospel. You've heard of people who were honorable, who were wise, people who were noble, and they accepted that invitation, didn't they? And they obeyed the gospel. And your name can be in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, I love that. You know, that's why I don't believe in predestination. It's not like a lottery, save, loss, save, loss, save, loss. If it's a lottery, why did Jesus say, whosoever will come? Is there anybody today who wants to come and be a Christian? Are we worthy? Are we thankful? Are we repentant? Are we obedient? Are we holy? Are we thankful for our salvation? Let's come around the Lord's table.